but he said, in the not too distant future, you will have on the seat of Peter, a Pope who will be amenable to the idea of married priests, homosexual priests, approval of homosexual unions, whether or not it's called marriage, uh, approval of basically everything that is condemned in the syllabus of errors. And it'll be done with a very thin Catholic veneer, but they're going to try it. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. I'm here with my friend Rob Morrow, who is one of the last living friends of the famous, infamous, legendary, mythical, whatever you want, whatever ab- uh, adjective you want to use, Malachi Martin. Um, if you don't know who Malachi is, you're going to learn a lot about him in this episode. But short Cole's notes, he was a Jesuit priest who sort of, um, you know, sort of not left the priesthood because you don't leave the priesthood per se, but he went and lived sort of a secular life in the sense of, not secular meaning unreligious, but in the sense of not being attached to the the order or diocese, and then sort of uh, used his skills for writing and apologetics and things. He had a background as an exorcist. There might be a story about him being consecrated uh, well as a bishop, uh, in pectore, as they say. Um, anyway, very fascinating story. And Rob was one of the last living friends there's probably a f- only a few left on earth at this time. So, Rob, how are you doing? Very good. How are you, Kennedy? Thank you for having me on your show. I appreciate it. I'm excellent. And Rob is, um, right now, he is writing a book, the sort of definitive biography about Malachi Martin. So I am going to put the links in the description to this video um, with a, a fundraiser because um, essentially we're not really sure whether it's going to get picked up in the traditional publisher sense or whether or not Rob's going to do this on his own. So in order to get those uh, processes underway, there's no free lunch, as they say. So please, if you could, consider donating any amount of money possible to help this go through. Rob is committed to getting the book done either way, but if we can help ease the financial blow, um, that would be great considering the, uh, the great resource of knowledge that is there to be found in his work. So today... Um, There's so much we can talk about when it comes to Malachi, but we thought we'd touch on a recent interview you did with uh, um, some scholars from Cambridge University, sort of about the downfall, let's say, of the Jesuit order. Perhaps, Rob, you could give us a little bit of a background of, of what happened there. Sure. What they wanted to know was why in the era when all the key trends of globalization across society, culture, religion, around the world, all seem to be accelerating and they're being driven by various actors. And they said one of the, in the religious domain, one of the key actors is the Jesuit order. That they are very prominent and especially they have gained an especially heightened prominence during the current pontificate. And that there is, um, with the recent appointments, for example, to the dicastery for the doctrine of the faith, as well as people who are uh, official consultators to the synod on synodality from the Jesuit order, there's a number of people who have come out with very, from a traditional Roman Catholic perspective, very heterodox statements Because one of the things they asked me was, they said, had caught their eye, was, we had never heard of something called the doctrine of a pope. Whereas, in recent weeks, I believe it's Cardinal Fernandez, has basically said, you cannot contradict the doctrine of Francis. And to me, that... Yes, that's right. Smacks of hyper ultra modern uh, ultra ultra montanism. Pardon my misstep. Um, so that was that was their perspective because they were under the understanding that the Jesuits had been always, you know, the loyal sons of the papacy, you know, willing to go to the ends of the earth. And I said, up until about 1965, that was true. However, starting in the mid-19th century, 
with the originator of the original modernism, uh, Alfred. You was please he. say his. He was he. Was he. Was he. And then his spiritual son, uh, George Tyrell, S.J., who was a very defiant Jesuit. He's the only Jesuit, he's the only priest in the world at that time who dared issue a public reprimand or reproval of Pope St. Pius X's uh, Pascendi. And for that, it earned him a reprimand and ultimately excommunication. Let me just, let me just add something there quick. Um with with uh, Tyrell. So ladies and gentlemen, if you look up the history of George Tyrell. And I did a um a long a long interview with um Father McGilvery on modernism and that's on my channel and we talked a lot about Loisy and Tyrell and I was reading yesterday because I'm writing a book on modernism. I was reading uh a sort of a, bi- a biography of Tyrell written by a modern Jesuit and he opened it up and he said um, he was one of the greatest Je- Jesuits of the 20th century or something. And um, it was so fascinating to see how he talked about him because he was talking about him like he was another Cardinal Newman. Like he truly understood the, the development of dogma. Was, you know, completely misunderstood. But Tyrell's belief was that after Pashendi came out, which was Pius X's condemnation of modernism. Correct. And it was basically about Loisy and uh, Tyrell. And Tyrell said, well, he didn't prove that uh, modernism isn't Catholic. He just proved that modernism isn't scholasticism. So he was he was so deluded that he believed that um, the only problem was that he wasn't a Thomist. The only problem was that he wasn't a scholastic. And he couldn't, I mean, maybe out of pride, maybe he intentionally, but whatever. He couldn't see the fact that, no, he was just a heretic. Uh, and, and Thomas gave us the most clear presentation of doctrine, even if there's other ways of presenting it. But he was just simply a heretic. Well, that, that's true. It, there's no gainsaying the fact that Tyrell was a heretic. Uh, one could argue he was an apostate. And then after the, when the oath against modernism was introduced by Pius X, which was mandatory up until the 1960s. The modernists themselves, they did what any good guerrilla organization does. They went to ground immediately. And they continued their sub rosa activities in seminaries, always being careful to say the right thing in public from an orthodoxy perspective. But they were circulating their writings and ideas and communication, etc. They then devolved in the 1940s and 50s to Tyre de Chardin. And I don't know how anyone can defend him with a straight face after you find out not only was he a rank heretic and all these silly phrases that he came up with, like the newosphere, which I'd like to know where that is. Um, And then he fabricated in trying to prove evolution. He fabricated in China the Piltdown Man hoax. Peking, the Peking Man, Peking. Peking Man hoax. uh, hoax. I don't know how anyone can take him seriously, yet the current Holy Father has lauded him in his statements in a de facto... uh, I'm searching for the right rehabilitation yes. of him, which is which is highly problematic. What Malachi said, in essence, and not just in his book, The Jesuits, but in the book that came directly after it, The Keys of This Blood, was that modernism uh, through the Jesuits in the last hundred years had committed a thoroughgoing infiltration of the Roman Catholic Church. Yeah. And he would say, today, it's all the way to the chair of Peter. Yeah. Well, you know, and and uh, we obviously hear a lot, of, a lot of this about infiltration. So with Taylor Marshall, he's got his, his book, Infiltration, with Father Murray, talks about the Freemasons and the infiltrating into the Cur- Curie and things like that. These things are all true. These things are all valid. Um, but the most important part of all of this infiltration is the philosophical and the dogmatic. 
the, the, the theological. Because whether it's a Freemason, whether it's a Zionist, whether it's a communist, whatever ist or someone who, you know, belongs to an ism who finds his way into the bosom of the church, ultimately it is the ideas and the morals that corrupt the doctrine and corrupt the faithful. And modernism, yes, it's condemned by uh, Pius X, and it, he did a very good job. Pius X is, I mean, he is one of the greatest popes in history. I mean, he probably is on the top five, if you, if you exactly. can rank them like that. I mean, people need to, un- I, I really think Pius X has been memory hold uh, by a lot of Catholics today. You very rarely hear anyone talking about him, even conservatives. You know, um, I think because, you know, as I'm writing this book on modernism, when you really look into his work, you see a lot of the things that he condemned, at least in, you see at least a shadow of them in the mainstream conservative Catholic theological presentation, especially when it comes to evolution. Um, you know, people, people think that they can separate evolution in the biological sense from Pius X's condemnation of evolution in the metaphysical sense, but you can't. Because evolution, as Wolfgang Smith says, your other friend and one of the only other last living, uh, last living uh, confrères of Malachi, um, you know, he says evolution, biological evolution, it is not a scientific statement. It's a metaphysical statement that created things create themselves. You know, so th- and if you think about that, that's very true. Because if there is, if there, if evolution is true, meaning if what is proposed as evolution is true, then what it means is that things create themselves, which is impossible. So the minute that you add God, even if you believe there's some possibility of God performing some sort of metamorphosis or something like that, it actually ceases to be evolution because the things themselves don't evolve. They change by the power of God, which is not the same thing. So evolution as such is a metaphysical impossibility. This is, people don't see this. Um, Anyway, so, but these ideas are condemned, and Pius X has largely been memory hold. Uh, and, you know, that four to 50 year period, kind of between Pascendi and the Second Vatican Council, things were actually pretty decent in the church. I mean, as far as theology, you know, exactly. before, the, before the council, people were pretty catechized. You know, people were reading that Baltimore Catechism. You know, the nuns were doing a good job in the schools. Um, but then for some reason, all hell breaks loose after the Second Vatican Council. And why do you think and why, why do you think that is? Pardon my interruption. Yeah. Pardon my interruption. I think I think you put your finger exactly on it when you you may have unintentionally done so, Kennedy. But when you said all hell broke loose, yes, I would argue was the forces of hell. Yeah. Why do you think? What do you think Malachi would say would be the main problem? Is how like yes, demonic spirit for sure. But then you know the devil uses instruments. So what do you what do you think Malachi would say was kind of like? you know, the boots on the ground strategy for how to get this modernism rehabilitated. In a word, he would say it was through the techniques advocated by the Sardinian communist of the mid 20th century, Antonio Gramsci. Gramsci. That's right. What you do is you take traditional Roman Catholic terms and concepts and you empty them completely make them devoid of their transcendent content so that Jesus Christ in their eyes, because I don't want to make a blasphemous statement, in the eyes of the communists, Marxists, in their eyes, you would have Jesus Christ as being not the Son of God, you know, part of the divine trinity, but he is the father of the working class proletariat the ultimate revolutionary against oppressive capitalist forces. And that, you know, our most holy mother, Mary Immaculate, becomes the mother of the proletariat workers and not the Immaculate Conception. And then once you do that and you slowly begin to catechize people in that way so that there is no such thing as sin as a personal offense, which affects negatively your relationship with God, mortally can sever your relationship from God, and you turn it into something that's against social structures so that sin becomes capitalism. And, you know, they equate it with greed and exploitation of the workers and pollution of the planet. And one could go on with the litany 
of the woke agenda, as we'd call it today. And it's yeah. she and Tom. That's right. And um, ultimately, connect all the dots here. So ultimately, modernism, the reason why it's such a difficult, it's not a difficult heresy to, to, to feel instinctively, but it is a difficult heresy to identify clearly. So your Catholic sense, you know, I'll, th- I'll try to think of an example. I remember this. So um, when I started as a Catholic school teacher, I had recently had my like interior reversion conversion. I was baptized, but, you know, I took the faith seriously finally kind of thing, big, big conversion experience. And I, that was just before I became a Catholic religion teacher, which was good because that means I taught the religion better than I would have otherwise. Um, it also shows you how bad the system is that they were going to hire me not knowing if I was Orthodox or not anyway. But um, so I remember my first day or first couple days, I was in there and one of the religion teachers, she was actually the head of the department. <clears throat> she was showing me the resources I could use. And I saw a book on a table that was used for grade nine. And the title of the book was Jesus of History, Christ of Faith. And I had no idea that was actually a condemned proposition. That's literally condemned in the, uh, at least in, if it's directly in name, and I think it's in Lemon Tabulisani, the syllabus of Pius X. It's in, the, it's in these documents. I don't have my notes exactly with it. But literally this idea that there is a Jesus that is historical and there's a Christ that is developed through the faith of people. This is condemned. I had no yes, idea. You're... I had no idea. But I was just praying the rosary. I was just, you know, being a Catholic. And I saw it. And something in my gut, I went, that feels icky. That feels strange. And, but I didn't know what it was. And more and more, so we see these things, Catholics with a Catholic sense, you know, if you can understand, if you can look at the Blessed Mother in an icon, if you can pray your rosary with devotion, if you can receive Holy Communion with devotion, you're an Orthodox Catholic. You just, you won't let yourself be a heretic. And you can sense these things. And, Correct. but modernism is like, it's like an octopus with like 14 or 15 legs. And you've got to pull all of them all together. And it's very difficult to do that. And but that's why, pardon my interruption. That's sorry, why yeah. our hero Pius X called modernism the synthesis of all heresies because modernism is a hydra. Yeah, and uh, and it's, and Pascendi is a very long encyclical. You know, I'm including yes. a, a decent. I'm including a decent portion of it in my my book. It's about 20,000 words, the encyclical itself. That is in uh, novel pages, you know, sort of five by eight or six by nine. Not, I mean, that's like 100 pages almost. Um, yes. it's, a, it's a lot of words, you know. It's a lot of words for an encyclical. Encyclicals are usually half that, maybe less. Um, you can read them in 15, 20 minutes. But this is, it's a catechism. It is, it is a systematic destruction of the greatest heresy in the history of the church. Um, so anyway, but ultimately... With this heresy, you will eventually not believe in the supernatural. Correct. A- and you will eventually be a pantheist. Meaning, you will believe that God and the earth or the universe are really the same thing. Because there's, there's no room for a creator in modernism. And this is why you will eventually be a Teilhard de Chardin disciple. Because... You have this religious sense that they talk about in Bashendi. This bubbles up towards whatever, uh, but there's no real God to go towards because there's no real objective reality. So ultimately, you have to find this salvation here on earth. And this is why I think, and I'll get you to comment, this on, comment on this in a second, this is why we have a pope who's more concerned with climate change than he is mortal sin. Because we have to save the earth as if we're saving God. Because that's the logical conclusion of, of modernism. I couldn't have put it any better. I think you're, you're exa- you framed it exactly right. That the current day modernists, they will, in their hearts, if not in their words, because they know how to sound orthodox when they need to, but they don't, in their heart, believe in anything that smacks of transcendent reality that there is anything beyond what we can see, feel, smell, taste, or touch. Which yeah. is why Paul VI said when he addressed the United Nations that our goal is to help man build his earthly home. 
And Maliki told me, he said, no, that's wrong. He said, the Pope should have gone before the United Nations and said, I stand here before you as the vicar of Jesus Christ. I am the sole living representative on earth who can speak authoritatively with his voice. But he didn't do that. And uh, Pope Francis just released his new exhortation within a call to the UN. You know what's interesting? Um, Laudate Deum, it's called. It's not an encyclical, so the Pope Splainers out there are going to say, well, uh, don't worry, it's not an encyclical, which is technically of a higher dogmatic value. Well, Morris Letizia was not an encyclical either. It was an apostolic exhortation, but we all know how that turned out. So just uh, stop pretending that, uh, you know, I'm not trying to be Henny Penny saying the sky is falling, but stop pretending that there aren't things falling from the sky when there really are. Um, But it was released October 4th, which was 120 years to the day from the release of Pope Pius X's first encyclical. Do you know what that one was? No, you've got me on that. A Supremi. And it, uh, I'm, so I'm writing an article right now for Crisis, and I'm comparing the two. If you look at uh, Pius X from 1903, October 4th, uh, to uh, Pope Francis's uh, 2023, October 4th, mm-hmm. in the first couple paragraphs, both of them identify that there is a disaster befalling the earth, and if we don't get our act together, it's going to be too late. With Pope Francis, it's climate. With Pius X, it's apostasy from God. And therein shows you in 120 years, so two generations really, we see a complete upheaval of the perception of, well, the theological uh, perceptions of the papacy, of the Pope, to the point where the most pernicious plague facing the earth in 1903, according to the Pope, was sin and apostasy. The most important and pernicious plague, according to the earth, in 2020, and on the earth, according to the Pope in 2023, is plastic straws. Exactly. Yeah, I don't know what else yeah. to say. No, it, it beggars the imagination because it completely removes the transcendent. We, I guess, the best way, Kennedy, I can put it is. The Catholic Church, the hierarchy, in its hubris, has decided God needs to be corrected. And, you know, I'll tell you, you started off the conversation with the fact that uh, a couple of days ago I'd been interviewed by a team from Cambridge University over in the UK. Wonderful people. And it just came out that you find faith in the most unlikely places because we were discussing the fact and this is a minor tangent but we were discussing the fact that i like to make guitars and that i'm currently building a replica of one of the guitars used by keith richards in the rolling stones and the professor said to me he says oh he he said you know keith richards he's he lives down the road from me and his his wife is well, she's not Roman Catholic. She's a very devout Protestant. And apparently, now that he's 80 years old, she has affected the change in him. And people have asked him, you know, well, why don't you party hard? Why don't you do this or that that you used to do years ago? He said, because now I'm at the point in my life where I have to think about what comes next. And I'm not going to the bad choice. Wow. <laughs> and he Look. said... I don't know about Mick. I can't talk for him, but I know I myself, I do not want to go to the bad place. Who's the other rock star who has a pretty Christian outlook? Uh, There's another one. Is Keith Richards American? No, he's British. He's there's, an American, there's an American one, and he likes golf, and he's very conservative, and he was one of those big 70s, 80s hair metal guys. Oh, I know who you're talking about. Ted Nugent? There's him too. There's another one anyway. But um, yeah. He's, he's big into hunting and, you know. Yeah, he hunts the hogs. Well, you know, it is funny. Uh, 
So I've got a, I'm conflicted about music because, uh, you know, I read Dr. Kwasniewski's uh, book on sacred music, and man, he does a good job of uh, destroying, you know, the it, basically laying out the principles of good music, sacred music, good folk music, and so on and so forth. But at the same time, within the sort of uh, like heavy metal community, and I'm not a huge heavy metal guy. I've listened to a little bit in my life, not a ton. Right. But, but there are a lot of really religious guys in it, weirdly enough. Um, I don't know if it's the themes they deal with, if it's, uh, but it's very strange. You know, there's a lot of guys who are moral, um, very poetic, very musical. It's just, it, anyway, it's, it's, an, it's a fascinating place where you do find people you wouldn't expect. Right. I mean, there, there are times when you run across a very interesting dichotomy. Yeah. Yeah. Between, but then there are also, like, there also are some, some pretty guys out there that do some weird uh, satanic stuff too. So I guess maybe they see that and then they kind of see it's real and they want to get out of it or something. I would not be surprised at that because, you know, one of the things Maliki once told me was, you may not believe in the devil, but the devil definitely believes in you. Yeah. I had a student uh, one time, I was teaching religion, and she was very smart, but she was a skeptic. She was like a genius kid. She graduated early from high school and stuff. And um, she was always asking me all these questions, as you do when you're an angsty, skeptical teenager genius. And uh, she basically said, well, Mr. Hall, fine, and all this stuff, but like, what, what matters if I don't believe in the devil and all this kind of stuff? And I said, well, you doesn't matter if you believe in cancer, it'll still kill you. And she went very <laughs> silent, you know. And I said, I mean, obviously, you know, you can say you don't believe in it all you want, but you might, you're going to die from it. Uh, obviously, it's a, spiritual, it's a spiritual thing with the devil, but, you know, you, you don't want to wake up 30 years from now and realize that uh, you should have listened to your religion teacher when he said, uh, you know, don't play with a Ouija board. But, um, okay, so um, let's get back on the the change in the Jesuits. So so Malachi did he ever officially leave the Jesuit order or was it sort of like he was dispensed from it or something? No, he requested uh via a document called a rescript from Pope Paul the Sixth, he requested permission to leave the Jesuits because he saw that under the leadership of people like Pedro Arupe and then later uh, Hans Kolvenbach, but that was after Malachi had left, that they were taking a hard left turn, and they saw their golden opportunity to do so when John the Twenty Third ascended the throne of Peter and announced that he was going to convoke a Second Vatican Ecumenical Council. They said they, that's when they had their aha moment. And, you know, whereas Christ said, our blessed Lord said, behold, I make all things new. They perverted that into saying, well, now we're going to make things new and we're going to do it the way we think it should be done. And they had modernism and Gramsci and Marxism in the back of their minds. What do we, so what, he what said, you, sorry, go on. So he just couldn't live with that. And because of the activities that he had undertaken for Pope Pius XII in the 1957 time frame behind the Iron Curtain. Because a lot of people say that, you know, well, if anything happened to him behind the Iron Curtain, how do we know that the KGB didn't turn him? Because he's been accused of everything from being a Martian to a, an agent from the Israeli Mossad. I mean, there's some wacky theories out there. And I just answer it this way that the church had a very extensive underground network in the Western Soviet Union and in the satellite countries of the Warsaw Pact. If they had turned Maliki Martin and tortured the information out of him, then overnight you would have seen across wholesale, across countries, the underground Roman Catholic Church and the church above ground disappear like that. And nothing ever happened. So therefore, ergo, he did not break. Therefore, they drew the inference, no matter what they did to him, he could be trusted not to break under torture. You know, he really is, Maliki is one of those figures that, um, if we can use the term devil's advocate, 
you know, uh, all the uh, mud that's been slinged at him over the over his whole life and over the last whatever thirty years since he's twenty years since he's died or whatever it was. Um, you know, uh, if you can, when you investigate into the workings and the life of Malachi Martin, considering how much has been said or opined or con- you know conspiracies about him, the fact that he can still come out, you know with a good reputation really shows you that his reputation must have legitimately been good because um, it's kind of like Archbishop Lefebvre. You know, I, I say when Archbishop Lefebvre is canonized one day, um, you know, he'll be the first canonized saint with a real devil's advocate in like 100 years. You know, I mean, uh, I laugh and people say, oh, I've, I found a theologian who disagreed with something Archbishop Lefebvre said. And I was like, oh, wow. You know, maybe he sh- maybe. Hold the presses. We should uncanonize St. Saint, Saint, uh, Thomas Aquinas as well, you know. Like, it's just amazing the, the level of perfection that these people expect and they find a little thing they disagree with here and there. So in the case of Malachi, I mean, he's been accused of literally everything. Where does that idea of him being a Mossad agent even come from? Because that's the strangest one I've heard. I have, I have absolutely no idea. There are people online, you can Google it. And there are people online, I'm not going to mention their names, but they are revisionist historians. There are also people who believe that, you know, the uh, the Nazi Shoah against the Jews, as well as uh, gypsies, homosexuals, etc., did not take place. They, you know, they're very quick to say that Maliki Martin was, was an agent of the Mossad because... Look, during Vatican II, he worked to help formulate some of the wording in the decree on religious liberty. And they make a big leap, but they just automatically have the hubris to assume that you, the listener, know that their accusation is valid and the case is closed. And that's their attitude. Now... That's an interesting point because it does seem to me, and maybe you can speak to this, because religious liberty is definitely not a traditional perspective. Um, It's kind of like an Americanist, and I mean that in the sense of what Pope Leo XIII talked about Americanism. doesn't mean if you're American you believe it, but he was referring to the the rise of this idea in in the West. Um, Maliki did have a kind of, he kind of swayed to the left, and then kind of came back to the right, didn't he? Like at some point, kind of yes. around the 60s or 70s? Yes, but we, we, have to be, we have to be very careful when we say swayed to the left in that he was a loyal son of the church, and he was a loyal son of the papacy. However, he came to realize his kind of St. Paul moment came in the mid to late 1960s when he realized that the church was succumbing to the zeitgeist, especially, you know, you look back at what they call the year 1967 being the summer of love and Woodstock. And there were a lot of churchmen who thought we have to get with the times. And somewhere along the line, Maliki realized, no, in transcendent reality, there is no such thing as time. Therefore, culture can change, but the timeless, the timeless truths of Roman Catholicism can never change. And, that's, and it became increasingly apparent in his writings that he was moving closer and closer to being a very staunch traditionalist. You know, um, again, to bring it back to Archbishop Lefebvre, which I always do. Everyone knows that. Um, I can't help it, guys. I'm sorry. But um, apologies. One of the reasons why I think he providentially was so ready to not go with the zeitgeist. I mean, everyone, uh, everyone at Vatican II did their best to squint and see the orthodoxy in some of the statements. Because you got to understand something, people. Sometimes people will go after Archbishop Lefebvre and they'll say, "Well, why did he sign off on this or that?" And it's like, listen, for one. Uh, people don't really understand how these councils take place. Um, there's a massive amount of literature to try to go through as fast as you can. You have experts, you have Pariti, you have these these assistants and things like that helping you understand and offer your collaboration and so forth. Archbishop Lefebvre and the Cetus Internalis Patrum, 
the International Group of Fathers, the conservatives at the council, they were working tirelessly, just playing catch-up, trying to figure out a way to to stop it from becoming a fully modernist council. And um, May I of... interject something yeah, along those sure. lines? Exactly. Proof of that is when Cardinal Ottaviani in the council was making what you would call today his keynote speech to the council. And halfway through his keynote speech, the modernist turned off his microphone and the place erupted in laughter when he started, he, he continued speaking. And he was almost, uh, you know, I believe it was blindness that he was succumbing to. And it was just an utter humiliation of Cardinal Ottaviani. And they took that as kind of like their take that traditional Catholicism moment. You know who it was who stole the microphone from Ottaviani? I don't know. Whoever it was, I'd smack them. But okay, ahead, this, is, this is the providence, okay? No one steal my idea here, okay? Because um, I have a biography in my mind I want to write. But anyway, um, the man who stole the microphone from Ottaviani, his name was Achille. Achilles, he was a bishop. And he was the same bishop who consecrated Archbishop Lefebvre bishop. So think of the providence there. So just hear me out here, ladies and gentlemen. You've all heard the story of Achilles, Troy, and so on and so forth. Perhaps you've heard of um, uh, Dietrich von Hildebrand's assessment of the council, and what did he call it? The Trojan horse in the city of God. In the city of God. And uh, so I believe Archbishop Lefebvre was the Achilles heel of the whole modernist scheme. They thought they got away with it. They snuck in and uh, he was able to spoil the whole pro uh, problem ultimately. And he was literally consecrated by a man named Achilles, who was the one who in a very active sense physically took over the narrative of the council by stealing the microphone. And Bishop Achilles Lenert was his name. He was ousted later as being a Freemason. So think of the, uh, uh, provid the, the storytelling here. It was a Freemason named Achilles who consecrated Archbishop Lefebvre, who stole the microphone from Cardinal Ottaviani, only to be undone by his Achilles heel, who was the, the little Frenchman that he, uh, that he uh, consecrated. Anyway, I think it's very fascinating. But so um, Archbishop Lefebvre, though, he is away from Europe during this 60s time. He is, he is not in Europe in the 50s. And, I mean, he was there for a couple of years after the war in a, in a sem seminary. Um, but that was just, well, France was destroyed. It wasn't like they were having a party time. And <clears throat> he's in Africa. So he's not in the zeitgeist. But wasn't he the provincial of the Holy Ghost Fathers? He was. Um, and he took that position essentially after the council um, and was then based in, 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 in Europe. But before that, he had spent, you know, 25, 30 years in Africa and so he's outside, he's not in, he was delightfully ignorant, blissfully ignorant of the mounting, you know, zeitgeist of the, you know, swing era and all this kind of stuff going on in contemporary Western culture. And then he finds himself when he's at Vatican II and shortly after he's going, what is this nonsense? You know, I'm, he wasn't numb to it is my point, which again just shows kind of the providence of where he was placed. I agree. And also there was a prominent Catholic cardinal uh, in the 1990s, the late 1990s. I think he was the cardinal who oversaw the Vatican Library. He was a devout traditionalist, and he often celebrated the Latin Mass in various famous cathedrals and churches around the world and around the United States. His name escapes me at the moment. Um, he was elderly. I attended one of his masses at the Church of St. Agnes in New York before the old wooden Gothic structure burned down in the 90s. But it's a matter of public record that he visited the tomb of Archbishop Lefebvre. And he placed, after saying a silent prayer, he placed his hand on the front plate of the tomb or of the mausoleum, and said very loudly, he made the sign of the cross, looked at it and said, Merci, Monsieur. 
Thank Cardinal, you. Card, Cardinal Oddi. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's a pretty great story, isn't it? It it is because here is a here is a cardinal in good standing yeah. with the curia, and yet after the alleged excommunication of Archbishop Lefebvre, he went to his tomb and publicly thanked him ostensibly for standing up to the revolution in the church. So one of the things that's so important about this, uh, um, the fact that Cardinal Odi went to his grave and thanked him and, and prayed at him and all these kinds of things. If someone is excommunicated, first of all, excommunications end at death, okay? But if somebody is a real excommunicant and they receive a public funeral, without there being an official recognition that the excommunication has been eff effectively listed, lifted, this is a grave scandal. So, um, you know, if somebody dies excommunicated, like your neighbor, the local parish should not give him a Catholic funeral. They should not. Now, it doesn't mean he's in hell because excommunication does not, first, it's not infallible, whatever. But the point is, excommunications means you're not allowed to receive the sacraments. Correct. Okay. So... The fact that a cardinal comes to his grave and prays at it and says thank you and is there as a representative of the church, this is a very scandalous action if Archbishop Lefebvre <clears throat> was really excommunicated because we have, I don't know if the right term is sacrilege, but we have, on the letter of the law, we have, we have something approaching something like a sacrilege where you have this public requiem mass for this bishop, it's a pontifical mass, and you have a, a visitor from the Vatican even paying reverence at his grave in a Catholic cemetery. This is a very big problem from the optics perspective. It just shows you that from day one, those who understood the situation never believed the hype. That's right. They understood the hypocrisy and they saw through it. Yeah. And by the way, when I the, uh, the assertions that I make about what Malachy Martin had done in the 1950s, there's a a very popular phrase now called, you've probably seen it online, where people say, someone will make an assertion, and then the next person will say, pictures, or it didn't happen. And I have the pictures. Yes, I won't say so, what it was, but you did send me a picture for something very fascinating, and I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. Yes. So, you know, he, he was, uh, Malachi, he wrote in The Keys of This Blood, and to a lesser extent in the Jesuits, but more in the keys of this blood, when he talked about the modernist infiltration of the church via, you know, originating with the permanent instruction of the Alta Vendita in the 19th century. But he said that ultimately, and this is prescient because he said it 30 years ago, but he said in the not too distant future, you will have on the seat of Peter, a Pope, who will be amenable to the idea of married priests, homosexual priests, approval of homosexual unions, whether or not it's called marriage, uh, approval of basically everything that is condemned in the syllabus of errors. And it'll be done with a very thin Catholic veneer, but they're going to try it. And they originally wanted to, the, the forces of what John Paul II called anti-church, because John Paul II very famously said, there's a battle going on now between the forces of the gospel and the anti-gospel. And he was right. It's just unfortunate. He was a mystically holy pope. It's just unfortunate that he was lacking in the more pragmatic day-to-day -day governance of the church and left that to a lot of people. Yeah, John Paul II will always be remembered as very, very, there's almost like two John Paul IIs. There's the uh, the man who's talking to Mary and performing miracle confessions and things like that and conversions. And then there's uh, some, some administrative gaffes, to say the least. So it's kind of, uh, anyway, we're all going to be judged exactly. when we die. We're all going to be judged when we die and we've done a lot worse, so. It is what it is. Well, not only not only that, but I wanted to say that, you know, people, a lot of people say that Malachi was in disgrace, that he was laicized, that he was off on his own, that he was a loose cannon. 
1995, before the Holy Father came to the United States in autumn of that year, I had mentioned to Malachi that a friend of mine had done a pen and ink rendition of Our Lady of Fatima and gave it to me, and I very ardently desired to give it to the Holy Father. And I, one day at lunch, I showed it to Malachi. I brought it with me in a, a rolled up mailing tube. And I said, I'd like to give this to the Holy Father. I'm going to Rome in two months. Is there any way I could present this to his holiness and give it to him? And he said, let me see what I can do. And he called me up the next day and said, can you meet me for lunch tomorrow and in our usual Italian restaurant? I said, sure. And he said, he slid an envelope across the table to me. It was dressed to a Monsignore at the Pontifical Biblical Institute. And he said, give this note to Monsignor so-and-so, and and he will get you into the semi-private audience that His Holiness holds before he goes and holds his primary audience for the several thousand people in the Nervi Hall, the Paul VI Hall. And I actually was able, I have a photo of me presenting this artwork to His Holiness. He was two feet away from me. I gave him the picture. He blessed it. It was taken, uh, I think it was uh, Archbishop uh, at the time, or Monsignor Jivish, who was his aide. And I was given by His Holiness a set of papal rosary beads, the white rosary beads, in return. So to me, if Malachi did not have standing within the Catholic Church, there's no way that I could request for him to have me meet Pope John Paul II and have it happen two months later. Yeah. The, also, I mean, I, by this point, with all the fanfare about Malachi and stuff, I, I can't find anything where he's ever been, you know, uh, castigated or reprimanded in a public letter or something like that. I mean, that, I don't think that exists. So, it doesn't. So, I mean... In fact, Kennedy, I can go one step further. Someone who bears... Your first name as his last name. I don't know if he's still alive. His name is William H. Kennedy. But in 2004, he contacted the Secretary for Communications for the North American province of the Jesuits, asking about the, uh, the sacerdotal status of Malachi Martin. And Father O'Keefe, who at one time was president of Fordham University and had been head of the Jesuits in the United States, he came out and he acknowledged that right up until his death, although no longer a Jesuit priest, he was still a validly ordained Roman Catholic priest, which was a very abrupt about face. And it's speculated, why did he do that? And some people have said, well, perhaps Father O'Keefe was knew he was going to be facing his maker fairly soon. And he wanted to correct an injustice against Father Malachi that had been done decades earlier. Yeah, pretty fascinating. Well, we're re re uh, getting around around fifty minutes here. I'm uh, I'm having uh, I've had this cold and flu thing for the last week or so, and I keep getting these tickles in my throat. So I've got to I've got to end it off in a second. But um, um, la one more time, where can we go to? Uh, support the fundraiser to get this book off the ground? Sure. It's at www. and this is all one word, givesendgo.com forward slash Malachi underscore Martin underscore book. And the funds used that are raised will go towards the creation of a formal literary proposal, which is the way you have to go now in the traditional publishing world. You have to formulate a 50 page, very intricate proposal. Otherwise it's rejected out of hand. And if it is rejected out of hand, I'm still going ahead with the effort, but you need narrative editors, story editors, copy editors, proofreaders, transcriptionists, there's a whole litany of people, marketing specialists, and that all adds up. And any, you know, if God wills it, and I either exceed or don't need all of the funds, then I will make a donation to a suitable Orthodox Roman Catholic charity. And all of those documents will be made publicly available. 
All right, ladies and gentlemen, support Rob. You can find the link. The link for this fundraiser will be in the description to this video. I can guarantee it'll be the first thing there. Um, so just click that and, and please be generous. And be generous with your prayers as well. And um, I know a lot of people watch this show who do work for publishing arms, whether they're Catholic or they're Catholics who work at secular publishing arms. If you want to get in touch with Rob and you want to help get this book off the ground, shoot me a note and, um, and I'll, I'll connect you. Okay. All right. Rob, as always, it's been a pleasure. Anything you'd like to say before we go? Yes. And this has nothing to do with our topic, but you know, apparently the news has gotten out among certain circles that you're going to have a blessed addition to your family in the not too distant future. And on behalf of me and my wife, we just want to offer our warmest congratulations and ask for God's blessings upon your soon to be born child. Well, thank you. Yeah, baby boy due to 24th of December. Um, have you named him? Yes, but we're not going to tell anybody. But we do have a name. Yeah. I thought I'd get a world first scoop. Nope, nope. Uh, <laughs> I joked to my wife, though, I, you know, he's not being named after me, but I, I, I joked I want to name him something the third, you know, just to, you know, like, you know, that football player for the Redskins, he was Robert Griffin the third. Just for no reason, just have on his birth certificate. Anyway, that's a joke, but... Okay. You're going to um, name him Marcel. He's not going to be named Marcel, um, <laughs> but uh, but we'll wait and see. Okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, as always, let me know what you think of the comments. Support Rob with your prayers and with your financial uh, options if you could. Also, I do have a little bit of news. Uh, starting in November 1st, I'll have a new venture that I'll be kind of switching away, I, adding to what I do and kind of switching things up a little bit. So, so um, pay attention for announcements for that. And uh, that's all. All right, oh, by the way, Kennedy, yeah. one, thing, one thing I'd like to add uh, is that when this book is published, and it will be published, um, I have confirmed through my literary agent that it's going to be narrated by the one and only Kennedy Hall. Uh, the audio. Well, there you go. Um, so uh, I've got to work on my, um, my sort of Americanized Irish accent if I'm going to be in persona Malachi at certain points. No, but... Uh, um, but also, yeah, that's another thing too. If you are a book publisher, et cetera, and you want to, um, have a, a reader for your books, I'm a professional narrator and I'm available. I'm pretty busy right now with some things, but, uh, I've got some time in the future. So anyway, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to talk to Rob. It's a pleasure for you guys to join us. This has been the Kennedy Report until next time. God bless. Thank you, Kennedy. <laughs>